everybody. Welcome to Trader Merlin Show. Glad to be back after a four-day weekend for myself. Hopefully you had a fantastic weekend out there, and I'm sure many of you are probably wishing I'd go on vacation more because every time I go on vacation, it's like this 5% up move in the markets over a couple of days. So I'll let you know for my birthday in two weeks, I'm going back on vacation. So go long on a Thursday afternoon, and I'll let you guys know exactly when. Um, today's going to be a fun show. I've had this gentleman on the program in the past. We had a great time on the Power Trading Radio Show, and I was like, you know what? I'd love to bring his experience on this program, shed some light into seasonality, patterns, and all, all types of uh, little things, nuances about the market that I love from this book right here. It is the Stock Traders Almanac. Uh, my guest today is Jeffrey A. Hirsch, who's also the author of uh, The Little Book of Stock Market Cycles, which is uh, another great book, Super Boom, which many of you probably love, which is why the Dow will hit 38,820 and how you can profit from it. I've got none other than Mr. Jeffrey A. Hirsch this day. Jeffrey, how you doing? Good. How are you, Merlin? What's going on? Uh, I'm I, I'm happy to have you back on. I was thinking, I'm like, who are some of the great guests I had on Power Trading Radio? And I was like, you know what? I got to have Mr. Hirsch on the program to talk again. So I'm I'm glad you ha took the time. I know you're extremely busy, so we'll jump right into it. Um, tell our viewers a little bit about your background because you're this is generational market knowledge that you mm -hmm. share with people. So walk us through a little bit of background on you. Well, uh, I was born and raised in Ultapan, New Jersey. Um, or my father started something called the Stock Traders Almanac back in 1966, the year that I was born. And I grew up around it, you know, born, bred, weaned, raised on cycles, patterns, seasonalities, market analysis. I grew up answering the phone, taking orders in the mailroom, shipping, sending out the books to all the brokers, running some numbers. I know people say that they think we're running a, a bookmaking uh, organization, <laughs> but doing the calculations for the Almanac. Uh, out of the Barron's lab pages with a calculator or an adding machine with my hands running and a piece of graph paper. And, um, you know, the story goes on. After school, I finished uh, going to college, and I went and I, I joined I joined Pop. Uh, one of my buddies said, what are you doing, Jeff? Go work for your father. So luckily, we had a similar mindset. Mine's not quite as iconic as his, but I was able to grasp some of the things that people didn't uh, quite get, you know, I know someone just around the office explaining it. And then, you know, I ended up turning the um, Almanac, you know, putting it on Excel for DOS back in like 92. <laughs> oh, date yourself now, buddy. It's getting old school uh, there. Uh, I just, I told you I was born in 66. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do it on a Commodore 64? I mean, geez. <laughs> no, it was an old like PC, you know, some Acer or something like, you know, it was something that some one of those companies that made all the computers for you. And then we converted it to Windows 3.1. I think that was 95. Um, and I used to do all the um, layout myself somewhat and a lot of the calculations and the almanac, the, pub, the newsletters. And now my partner, Christopher Mistel, who is a much uh, larger math brain than I have, uh, has basically we have a piece of software that he's written using, you know, I guess it's SQL Server, Visual Base. I don't know what, what, what I think that's what it what, what it is. But you know, I can go there and click and run queries, and the stuff, the thing that used to take us months to do for the Almanac can be done in days, um, if not less, depending upon if it's something new or something we're updating. So, um, and you know, over the years we did several different newsletters. We had a Beating the Dow newsletter, we had Ground Floor, Smart Money, uh, Mutual Fund letter, and combined them all into. Um, the Almanac Investor Newsletter, which sits at our digital subscription, sits at our website, stocktradersalmanac.com. And we run all of the ideas and, you know, trading um, recommendations, uh, longer term or swing trading, investing mm -hmm. ideas and the different seasonal strategies and update the Almanac throughout the year. We do a monthly outlook. Uh, we look at all the commodity trades that, that you like. I mean, we probably don't uh, pull the trigger on as many as, as, as you might, but um, the ones that come out at us that correlate well with stocks and ETFs, we, we will jump on. And you know, we still track the, the futures, um, you know, trades that we discovered with John Person, mm -hmm. uh, who I just had an email exchange with today, who, who uh, taught me a lot about the market. And, uh, you know, we don't do the commodity book anymore. More, and it's kind of a shame because it, I guess it was a 
a niche audience, but it was great to work with John, so um, I do miss that. Yeah. Um, guys, there's a lot of information. I've mentioned this before. Um, you know, I'm an I'm a okay book person. I've got a shelf over here full of books. I've got a garage with tons and tons of books, most of which I don't read because, honestly, most of it's just regurgitated garbage that somebody read in another book and then spews it back out with a couple of different changes that they run in a Word document, and they make a bunch of money off a different book. This is one I've told you guys many, many times. If you have anybody who's into trading or investing, this is the gift to get them because it's you can nerd out in this all day long. There's so many patterns and cycles and just every day has got some special quote. I mean, you'll find it all kinds of these weird little nuances that most of us would never take the time to figure out. And thanks to Yale and Jeffrey for digging into all those numbers. But it is a, a great resource for you. You can find more information at tradersalmanac.com. Um, and a ball stick that book is on Amazon. We'll talk about the newsletter in a second. Um, let's go into, I mean, we're in a very interesting time. Of course, we've got election mm. time coming up. But uh, you and I talked about one of the seasonality pieces, which is kind of that six best trading months of the year. Maybe walk us through some of the, the highlights of the Almanac's forecast for this year. Well, I mean, the best six months is one of Yale's brainchilds. Everyone knows the phrase, sell a man, go away. I'm not sure everyone knows the rest of it. Come on back on St. Ledger's Day. People forget that it's not just sell a May. I, I like to say you got to buy in October to get yourself sober. Mm. <laughs> I like so, that one. Yeah, it kind of runs a little bit, but just a way to remind people to, um, you know, use the seasonal rhythms of the market to get in. This year, things are turned on their head. We got an election, we got a pandemic, we got a virus, uh, we've got civic unrest. There's a lot of things going on that are sort of trumped, if you pardon the pun, uh, um, seasonal patterns. But the outlook for the Almanac was much more bullish than, you know, uh, it came out of the year, you know, in, in March, because I have an incumbent president running for re-election. Uh, we're six months are not quite as, as weak uh, during an election year. But here we are seeing, you know, market seasonal patterns start to return. And September was a little bit more normal with the, the seasonal ebbs and flows of, of human behavior with their, you know, with finances. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're expecting a year-end rally, which is stronger, you know, from this time when, when an incumbent wins re-election, uh, weaker from, you know, this period of time when an incumbent loses. But the rally, the post-election rally, you know, just in November, uh, when a president is ousted, when a new president comes in, the Novembers are stronger when you get a new president. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's about as bullish as we thought it was going to be at the outset, but that big dip in the middle. Kind of threw you off a little bit. <laughs> kind of threw us all off. Uh, Who would have thought we'd be walking around with masks uh, and, and, you know, talking about social distancing and bubble you know social bubbles right. and stuff and not uh, just walking around with masks on literally getting citation if you don't have one on i mean there's there's a difference there of like i want to protect myself this is like no you wear a mask or you're getting a ticket it's bizarre i was just in uh, in boston this weekend and uh same thing you know you gotta have a mask on you're getting fines and things it's, it's crazy um the the sell and may go away i mean this is an interesting one and i think just when people say it, it sounds it sounds definitive, but it's actually rather vague because when in May do you sell? When do you buy back right. in October? The November through um, through April, April piece. Um, you know, are we are you are you, is it kind of like hey, it's November first, just kind of arbitrarily buy the markets, or is it wait? Is there is like a better time end of November? Yeah, we use MACD for that stuff, but okay. before I, I tell you how that that works, you know, it's not for us. It's not go away in May. It's sell in May and it's reposition in May. And you know, we have a seasonal switching strategy for the the main market funds. You know, the, the Dow, S and P, Nasdaq, and Russell. And we will, you know, unload those things uh, on a seasonal base, basis with our signals, but. We will not just sell any stock or ETF that we have a position in, whether it be you know uh, a seasonal sector trade or um, some of the stocks we pick. Uh, you know, there's still the old the, you know the old rule that if if it keeps going up, you don't sell it. I mean, mm -hmm. you sell half on a double, take some profits along the way. But um, the going back to your question, the main seasonal pattern, the best six months, most of the markets gained gains are made from November through April. So we use the October 31st and April 30th dates for the, the basic, you know, full month seasonality. But the um, late great Cy Harding 
in his book Riding the Bear in 1999, which is still referenced in our Stockard as Almanac, took Jerry Appel's, and I'm, I'm friendly with uh, Marvin Appel, Jerry's son. Jerry, we just lost Jerry too last, last year he passed. He's the one that created MACD. I'm assuming you guys all know MACD. Yep. Um, so layering the MACD uh, in, in keeping with the original purpose and original usage of MACD, which is to confirm or deny an entry or an exit based on another reason, whether it be fundamental, technical, or in our case, seasonal or cyclical or, or, or trend oriented, um, we start looking for a seasonal buy signal in um, October 1st, uh, on or after October 1st, and we need a new signal, and we need it uh, across uh, the three main U.S. indices, Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, Composite, and um, when we get that trigger across the three of them, we will issue our seasonal buy signal. And for the buy side, we also use the original Appel work, even though his son Marvin just tweaked it a little bit, the 817.9 on the buy side. I think Marvin's using the 619.9 versus the one that everyone thinks is is uh, um, you know you can be is a cookie cutter you can use for anything the 1226 or 1259 mm -hmm. which we use on the sell side reason for that is you know bottoms are more of an event they happen quicker we want to use a faster shorter MACD to get in uh, quicker during during and bullish moves are generally you know start a little bit faster whereas tops take a take time and are more of a process so we want to stay in as long <coughs> Um, as we can, uh, and we'll use the 1226.9 on the sell side. And that, again, is after April 1st, um, and that's just for Dow and S&P. NASDAQ has a best eight months that runs through June, so we'll be looking to get out of the uh, NAS, the, the Qs, and the, and the IWMs in, um, you know, after June 1st with a MACD crossover sell signal. Guys, it's interesting when he's talking about this stuff because if you look at the, the historical um, – patterns of market and this is what was so great about what Yale started and, and Jeffrey's continuing on is just looking at those kind of patterns where you know we have these market mantras like sell in May and go away or Santa Claus rally or as goes January so goes the rest of the year you know there's reason behind a lot of these and what I like about um, and I actually picked this up in the Stock Traders Almanac is when you add in something to to time your entries better um, the results were significantly better by using the MACD as your entry and exit mm -hmm. during that best six months so it's not arbitrary and that's why I asked this question it's not like hey mm -hmm. let's buy November 1st and we're gonna sell it April 30th you know it's not that it's saying okay now I should be looking for potential buy because I know that historically these next six months are going to be more bullish than bearish therefore let me find that optimal entry and, and that MACD really helping not just get a time your entries but to keep you in those trades during that period of time I thought that was very interesting from the uh, Traders Almanac thank you and and on top of that it's also sector oriented I mean most of the these main stock sectors come into their bullish season in October and there's a whole there's about three pages in the Almanac that is you know um, geared towards that and 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 where that sits, pages 92, 4, and 6. We also do um, carry those in the, in the newsletter service in our um, sector seasonality trades. Um, and there's also a set of, of sectors that do much better in the worst six months. Utilities, uh, that sort of thing. Materials happens to be great short in the best six months. Mm. Excuse me, scratch that. Worst six months. Um, and there's a bunch of those interesting uh, shorts and longs on sectors uh, in, in the Almanac and the newsletter. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, stock picking. Now, we have a pretty robust fundamental stock screen that we use, um, which is overlaid with technicals. We look for, you know, acceleration of uh, revenue and earnings growth, as well as good valuations and decent relative strength, but not blowing it out of the water. We want to get into things that are kind of sleeping. Uh, a little bit under Wall Street's radar, not heavily followed. And we will look for that new basket of long, you know, growth stocks, small, mid, and large cap around this time of year um, at the beginning uh, of the best six months or end of the worst six months. So we're not just picking stocks every month and chasing different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's plenty of people out there that do that. So we're overlaying the seasonals on top of our fundamental stock screen, kind of like the MACD overlaid on top of the seasonal. So you're looking at sort of two major variables or major indicators uh, or, or screens to, to get in and out of, um, you know, stocks and, mm -hmm. and sectors in the market. You know, historically, we've had these these 
great market patterns, which of course is the, the basis of Stock Traders Almanac. Does does an environment like this change a little bit for you? Because you were just talking about how you're, you're trying to find these kind of under the radar growth stocks, but I mean, are there really under the radar growth stocks right now? It seems like everything in their mother is overly inflated because of all the stimulus that's been put in, whether it's the Fed or the government. I mean, it seems more challenging than ever. Oh, the market is very challenging this year. I mean, you know, nothing works 100%. You give me a system that works 100% of the time, you know, You'll sign never see me, me again. <laughs> right. Uh, there are, there's a force majeure clause in all contracts. There are things that happen out there in this year. And, um, of course, there are things out there. Uh, once we run the full screen, we'll pick a time period when, when the market is, is looking good and we get our MACD signal or when it looks like it's coming, and we'll run a screen through the 8,000 stocks in, in Zach's research. So we've come up with things. I mean, Regeneron is on our list. We picked that last October. Um, I don't know if you could pull up. I'm not seeing what your screen right now. I'm sort of... Uh, um, yeah, I can't. I'm, I'm prohibited from trading biotechs and pharmaceuticals. So is it RGRN or RG... Yeah, you, why are you uh you want a list or something <laughs> no no it's a personal thing my trading plan which i wrote in 2001 i got burned so many times on biotechs and pharmaceuticals i just said I to hell you. with it I i'm out you. but this i i used to pick small cap biotech stocks without a lick of er, earnings or revenue either but R, R E G N, if memory serves okay it, you could show my list i don't know if you want me to show the list of stocks on the screen but that just came through where i weren't looking for that that stock came through because the revenue and earnings growth was going up. The valuations were strong. So this is not your, you know, your grandfather's biotech stock that was a fly-by-night thing. And I've always thought, or at least since I did that super boom book that you mentioned, that the part of the super boom equation is the, you know, you got um, the end of war, like called the the Gulf or the Iraq thing, uh, the long extended war on terror. You got inflation, which we didn't get a whole lot of this time around, and we've seen other periods of that. We have the super boom thing. And then you've got, you know, what I call a culturally, excuse me, a culturally enabling paradigm shifting technology. Technology, And biotech has always been something that I thought could be part of that technological um, variable in the, in the super boom equation because of, I mean, look at everyone's getting older. We're all doing healthcare things. Yep. There's new stuff coming out. We get this pandemic to prove it. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me, that was just an example. We also had picked um, Arista Networks, which is the cloud computing thing on the more stodgy side. McCormick Spices came through, Church mm -hmm. and White. So, you know, during the worst six months, we'll look for some, some dividend payers. And I know some slick traders who uh, write covered calls against uh, you know, stocks that have um, cons consistent dividends and, and really reduce their, you know, cost basis and make a good decent, good amount of money on it. Some uh, ex-engineers that that, uh, that stuff just clicks in their head. So there's a lot of different things you can do out there. you got to find the thing that clicks sure. with you. Um, so we're six months. We're looking at sort of more defensive um, stocks that are going to kick off some income. And if they keep going up and they, and they keep doing well, we'll hang on to them. Around the you know early fall, we're looking for you know more growth-oriented stocks, um, and some years you know they'll be more geared towards one industry or not. It could be more oil and gas, could be more um, you know uh, regional power, regional banks. You know you, we see a lot of different patterns coming through when you when you're looking for value and growth and sort of not yet outperforming mm -hmm. in a screen, and you, you see where it, what's sort of lying below the surface of the market. So. Um, again, at StockTradersOmanac.com, you can. There's a free trial there. If you go to try to look at something, you can just click on it. If people want to have a, a little kick the tires, run through and see the stocks that we have out there. Um, there's. I got the web page up right now, guys. I'll make it a little bit bigger for you. StockTradersOmanac.com. Uh, you you're doing? I don't think I. Do I have to do something? No, I can. I can share it on my screen. Um, you won't be able to see mine. It's, it's the way the Skype thing works. But I've got it all set up here. He's got. Uh, you see the newsletter on here as well. So if you want to subscribe to that one, he's got um, most recent issues, September 24th. So a monthly issue. Looks like you got one. Should be coming out here soon. Uh, Thursdays. That's our day. All right. Um, Jimmy Lee says, when will the 2021 issue be available at Stock Traders Almanac? My guess is probably in November, right? Uh, I hope. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, we're having some... Uh, 
graphic design issues with our publisher right now. No, so. oh, all right, okay. No, I don't want to. I don't want to jinx it, but I was on the phone with some people today. It should it should be on the press already, but it'll be out before the you know before you need it. It'd be Talk perfect for that Christmas it. basket coming up here soon. <laughs> I like to get it out before Thanksgiving, but it may come a little bit later than that this year. I, I have to take delivery first. I mean, who, I don't know who, who's asking if, they, if they're getting it from Amazon or whatever. Um, if you want to get it from us, you can. But remember, the, the newsletter comes with a free copy of the book if you want to have a look for a year or even a, a couple of months and, and see what kind of um, you know trades and investment ideas and, and market analysis we put out there. Yeah, guys, there's um, there's another copy here. Now, this is an old book. They're not doing the full book anymore. It's uh, the Commodity Traders Almanac, and a lot of that information is in the newsletter now, so that's kind of incorporated in the newsletter. Um, you know, I, I love it because I mean, there's such bizarre things in here. Like, I'm looking at it right now, and I just opened the first page. It was May 22nd. It says, short coffee, 71% accuracy since 1974, ending August 8th. It's like, okay. I didn't have to do anything. Someone looked at you know tons and tons of data to come up with these ideas. And well, you don't have to trade them. At least you can follow it. Maybe be interested in the subject at that moment. Because honestly, I'm probably not going to hold coffee for that long. But it could be the basis for me making a trade in the back of my mind, knowing that there is a downside movement from in that window of time. So just great information. Precisely for you. how to use it. Yeah. Does it also tell you which contract? Uh you, you might want to be trading so you don't have to worry about rollover. It probably does, but I think I already closed that one up. <laughs> I can't open I the book in the same spot I think two it also times. gives you a, a highly correlated stock or ETF. Like yeah, it says, it says to go with the U, so it's, it says to go with the September contract. So nice. but you can, There's also for non-futures traders who want to have a little bite at the uh, commodity trading uh, you know, seasonal apple, They can. there's a stock or ETF that's usually presented as well. That tracks it closely. You know, uh, for those that don't know, um, Jeffrey is also the chief market strategist at the Probability Fund. I'm just kind of curious because the question came through here from Tom. He says, what are Jeffrey's thoughts on the FANG stocks uh, in the super boom? Obviously, somebody who is a chief market strategist, you know, these these got across your radar at some point because they are clearly the, the, the lead dogs pulling this or have been the lead dogs pulling the sled. What are your thoughts on these FANG stocks? I mean, I use them all. I'm a <laughs> consumer of them. I mean, I'm on Amazon. I'm on Google. You know, it's. It, I do face. I mean, it's 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 part of it. I mean, it, this super boom, the equation, the the technology equation, probably isn't just one. <clears throat> this time around, like back in the 19th century, it could have been you know the 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 combustion engine or the automobile in the 20s, but. Uh, the technology that what we're doing right here over you know this virtual world it, is all part of that super boom and I and we're seeing it I mean back in 2010 when I made that forecast in the news that are May 2010 the Dow was around 10,000 I forecasted 38,820 based upon the pattern that Yale discovered back in the 70s hmm. <coughs> I'm sorry where do we close today I, I Look, we were down a bit. Yeah, 28. I'm on the future, so it's 28,570, uh, 28, on the YM futures. That's dang close to 38 from yeah. 10,000, and and that was to ha occur b by the year 2025. Oh wow! And so that was in the book. You had 2025. Yeah, I think you might beat that the way that we're rolling. But oh, by the way, guys, I'll, I'll... I think we're ahead of schedule. So basically, and, I think the and this is are a big part of it to directly answer this gentleman's question. So, <clears throat> um, it's it. I. Personally, I'm looking for other up-and-coming fangs, um, you know, or things that aren't fangs yet, right. or, or might have a different acronym or TLA when when their when their day comes. But um, all those companies are driving it. Yeah, it's interesting seeing the the, the power of the, the the few there. Just kind of curious, guys. <coughs> I, I have um, on the chart here that you guys can see at home. I, I just put a crosshairs back in May of 2010 when Jeffrey was putting that in his newsletter and that book came out, I think, 2011. Um, you know, it's a 28,569 right now. 38,000 might not to be, be too far off. Do you think there were, I mean, I think over time we all know we're going to get to 38,000, but I think you might actually beat it within the next five years given the way that the stimulus and all this money comes pouring into the economy. Not bad. I'm going to do well yeah, now. That whole, that whole money thing, that helicopter of money is... is is real. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's impacting things. Uh, people are buying stuff. 
And it's probably not going to stop anytime soon. I mean, it's funny because you look at it and it's like, all right, this was a big experiment, right? You just keep printing money, printing money, stimulate. And everybody says hyperinflation. We're going to see massive problems because of this. You know, you can't keep doing this. You're, you're making money in thin air. And nothing bad has happened yet. So if I'm one of these guys in the you know Federal Reserve or politician, I'm going, hey, it ain't going to break on my watch. So keep on printing. So, I mean, all the forces that's are pointing. What, that, that's what he said, basically. Yeah. He's a little more, you know eloquent about not eloquent but a, a little more uh highbrow about what he's what he, you know what powell was saying but you know why why do you think there's no inflation even though that's part of the super boom equation me personally i'm asking you i i i, I disbelieve i believe there is inflation and i we talked about this with my viewers i'll look at something like uh, i was joking with the viewers I, I love beer right so i went out and i was drinking um uh red stripe a jamaican beer right yeah, come on. Beer in a bottle is 12 ounces, so the, the the basket of goods and services has a 12 ounce of bottle of beer, and there are a six pack of beer, right? Well, what they're doing is the price hasn't gone up at all, but they've removed 0.8 ounces from each bottle, so the bottle is now less beer. It's using less glass, so the costs go down for the producer, but the cost to me has stayed the same. That's yeah, that's there, inflationary. There's been a big trend in reducing contents of packages yeah. to keep the price the same. So there's food and energy inflation, there's healthcare inflation, there's education inflation, but staples, there's no inflation. Yeah, well, yeah I I don't know, but eggs, toilet it's paper. Kind of evil, you know, it's actually some of the some of that stuff's going down. So that equals out. I mean, I'm no economist, but I can play one on TV for a few <laughs> minutes. You do well. Um, <laughs> so I I'm with you on the inflation, especially you know we both live in relatively higher tax urban areas, though mm -hmm. I may be vacating at some point in the <laughs> next decade uh, for warmer climbs <clears throat> and more golf, but, um, you know, property taxes are going up, the yep. cost of doing things around here is going up, yet the CPI and PPI don't really budge. So no. They came out today, a, it, it was very low. There's a productivity low. issue, there's, you know... Uh, 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 the ability for us to continue to make stuff. Remember, we had that whole toilet paper shortage. Yeah, that seems to be over. Yeah, you but know? you know, you you say that, but it's so funny. The toilet paper rolls now are smaller. They're they're so I don't remember what a, what the width of a toilet paper roll was. I'm gonna say it's like five inches or so. Now I, it's like I, four I, and a half. You took a half inch of my roll. Of I gotta be more careful when I wipe, man. This is <laughs> to me that's inflation. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> I ordered something off the internet from Amazon and it came from China and they were tiny like like mini rolls. I was like, yeah, what is yeah, this? Yeah. And you're like, I got a great deal, but like it's like a it's a sig disposable wipe. It's one one it's wipe a, and you're done. It's a sad state of affairs for uh Americans when, you know, they it is. get out of toilet paper. I mean What let we me ask you real quick. Take it, a little lesson and clean a few things up and not be such Sure, sure. I know you got a bunch of stuff to do. Let me, I was trying to get you out in a half hour. So let me ask you one more thing because I know we've got a couple guys in our audience who are huge, huge metals and, and um, natural resource guys. What's your take on metals? I mean, like like gold, silver, you know, these types of uh, commodities. Uh, place in your portfolio? Uh oh. Did I lose you? What did I do? Oh uh -huh. no! I was, I was looking at the chat box for a second. Oh, no second. worries. Uh, Joe, where do you where do you see precious we metals have gold for in you? Our portfolio. Say again? We have gold. I okay. Mean, it's a seasonal trade that we hung on to because it kept going up. Um, there's lots of, I think, December to May is a great copper trade. That's worked like a charm. And we've traded southern copper. We used to trade global brass and copper holdings, but they got bought by a Swiss company. Um, silver has been a little elusive to trade. It hasn't quite moved so much, but, it, you know, uh, yeah. oil and gas are, are something that we... we definitely work with i'm more of an xle ung type of person but it's um you know based upon the, the commodity trade so those are the kinds of commodity traders almanac trades that appear in the, the almanac investor newsletter mm -hmm. on an annual basis Nice. Yeah, I'm just curious. I know a lot of people are like exceptionally bullish on it i mean you know as, as you know as well as i do that this is this is not a um a puzzle that has two pieces in it. You know, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces to this market that are going to be driving any time. So all we really have to do is go off of probability because nothing is definitive. It can change on a moment's notice. So um, on a long term basis, for somebody who's an investor, you know, I, I think having a little bit of gold is not going to not not a horrible thing. I trade it seasonally 
I'm not somebody who's like, all right, I'm bullish on gold right now. Uh, we picked up gold for the usual summer trade in, in um, July of 2019, and the GLD, we're still holding it. It's up 30% for us. Uh, silver's been uh, not quite as successful, and we're currently not in any of the other natural resources right now because it's out of season. So the, we were short crude. Uh, so we got short crude September 3rd uh, using the SCO at about um, we're looking for a price it hasn't hit our price yet we just added it on October 8th at 1575 the ultra short huh yeah that's how we trade the futures okay that's, I mean as you said our, it's our, our style I mean I like the, the look at the 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 trend in the futures, but I've never been a you know a, a, a derivatives trader or investor myself. So, cool. All right. Um, anything else you want to talk about? I know you. We, we looked at kind of a little bit of uh, the best six months. Talked about some sector seasonality. You gave us some insights and some thoughts. Anything else you want to cover before we, uh, we cut out? I, I think if people want to just hit my blog, give you a little idea, of some things, a free trial there. But we got this election, uh, you know, season coming up here, and I think it's crucial to see what the market does here going into it because if it if it gets weak going into the election that's probably uh an indication that you know we may get a change of power which can be uh difficult for next year i know everyone thinks that biden comes in we're going to get a big stimulus plan but you know post-election years for for first-term democrats um they usually try to change a lot of things and and um it, it hasn't been great historically doesn't mean 2021 is not going to be a great year but it's something to keep your eye on and then there's all the year-end seasonal stuff, getting ready for the best six months, as you mentioned. We've got, you know, uh, the small caps picking up here uh, seasonally. They've already started to light up a little bit. Um, <clears throat> small cap outperformance begins at the end of October. And then, you know, also just the, the last two weeks of, of the year is where uh, small caps outperform large caps. So that's another major you know, trend to, to keep your eye on. Jerry, let me ask you real quick. Um, when I look at something, so I had uh, IWMs. I have the Russell 2000 futures up here, and you said, you know, usually the, the the seasonality of it, money comes in in October. As more and more people follow these patterns and trends and say, okay, in my mind, I'm just making the number up. Let's say October 15th, we really start to see uh, the small caps take off. And the more mm. people that see that, you're always getting somebody who says, well, if it comes in October 15th, then I'm going to buy it on October 1st just to make sure I front, get in. The front runners. And then the next year, all of a sudden starts October 1st because somebody goes, well, I'm buying, you know, September 15th. It, it, how has that changed for you, the, ti the timings of these seasonalities? Some have shifted, yeah. for sure. Thanksgiving trade has been a big one. Um, the small cap trade, you know, th that I was referencing has not been influenced so much. January's, you know, gone down. Its return levels have been depleted. Mm -hmm. So you do see the anticipating and the shifts of things, and that's why we track it on a regular basis. One of our, you know, you know, thing. One of the ways we look at it is looking at different time frames. So you know, even on the sector page, it's got the, t the five, ten, and fifteen year time frame in the almanac. But we'll look at the, you know, back to nineteen fifty. We'll go to. 71 for when NASDAQ began and post 87 is a period I like to look at after they you know threw in the circuit breakers of the collars after the crash right. and then the recent 21 year history so we'll compare all of those different time frames to see <coughs> any shifts in that seasonality that may be um, impacted by either a change in behavioral patterns or anticipators or front runners like you were mentioning yeah Interesting. All right. Well, hey, Jeffrey, thank you so much. Uh, who knows? Maybe we'll get you back on after the election and see what your thoughts are on things going forward. I do I appreciate you taking the time and sharing some thoughts on uh, trends, markets, and the best six months. So thank you so much. My pleasure as well. Love to come back. All right. Take, take care, my friend. Thanks, brother. All right. Guys, that was Jeffrey Hirsch. He is the editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac. Mm -hmm. He's also written uh, – he's a chief market strategist at the Probability Fund. I saw a question came through here. Does he give uh, services to any big Wall Street firms? I can assure you that Wall Street firms are that have copies of Traders Almanac because it's just such good information. Um, my assumption – well, because he's working with Probability Fund, which is a fund management company doing ETFs and things like that, 
uh, not ETFs, um, mutual funds, you know, they might be talked there, but unfortunately I, I didn't get to see Easy providing his services and newsletters. Given the quality of the content that I've seen over the years, it wouldn't surprise me to see institutions having access to, especially the seasonality aspect of it. There's a ton of great information in there. And I, the one that I, again, I'm telling you guys, this is probably the best book for anybody who's into the financial market. So, um, all right, that was, uh, again, Jeffrey Hirsch. You can go to Stock Traders Almanac, which I had up here just a minute ago to get any information you want. He's got a blog. He's got all kinds of other information there that you can check out. I think he said with his newsletter, you get a free copy of the Stock Traders Almanac, which is pretty awesome. But uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. And next time we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into it. Just wanted to get you introduced to Jeffrey and what he does because he's got a ton of information and some great background. Um, all right, so there was a question that came up, and I'm going to see if I can bring this up for you guys. And I, I can't remember. I think it was Naum asked me. He says, "Hey, what what is the 1226.9 that he's referencing? Right? What is that? What does that mean?" There's. I've done this before where I talked about technical indicators. Wow. Eric, thank you so much for the contribution. You no questions to that? It said uh, I got a $20 contribution for my uh, Blanton's fund. I assure you I'll put that to great use on Friday because it's been a great week already. Uh, thank you so much for that, Eric. I appreciate it. I talked about different uh, indicators and configurations. So what Jeffrey was talking about was we were looking at the best six months of the year, which is historically November to April. It's just there's nothing you can do to argue that it's simple looking at the monthly returns of the market and that window from November to April is historically I believe going back to the 1950s the best six month returns it's just absolute fact now what he was doing in that he was saying look I don't want to just arbitrarily say hey November first I'm buying because that might be the highest price and you know I could have bought it later in November at a lower price and done much better so he was using tools like MACD moving average convergence divergence as the tool to do that now what a MACD does is it takes two moving averages normally it's a 12 period moving average and a 26 period moving average and it plots the difference between those two so let me explain by showing you a visual chart because obviously I'm not going to do the best job just sitting here talking about it without any visual. So I will add on a, move, a MACD on here, which is what we're looking at. And you guys see these two lines. Really what these two red, there's a blue line and a red line. What they represent is this. The blue line represents the difference between the 12 and the 26. So remember now you, you were telling, asking what's that 12, 26. That's where the 12 and 26 come. This blue line is the difference between those two. So if you're to plot a 12 period moving average, and now, now I'll really geek out, all right? Um, let me uber geek out here for you guys. I'll go moving average two lines, and I'm gonna put a 12 period and a 26 period on it. So now you can see what is actually creating these things. Here's the 12, and here's the 26. Okay, so at the top, you guys can see the, the 12 and the 26 period moving averages, okay? Now, down below, this blue line is, all it's representing is the difference between the difference between those two lines. This lower red line here is the nine. What the nine is was um, the smoothing. So it, it basically it's a moving average of this blue line. Okay, so let me rephrase, uh, re rehash this. On the bottom of your chart, that blue line is the difference between your 12 period moving average and your 26 period moving average. That's called your moving uh, your um, your MACD line. The red line is called the signal line, and the signal line is just a nine period moving average of this blue line. So it's just trying to give you a trigger by using a signal, and that's what he was referencing. He's saying we were using, in some cases, a 1226.9, which is what's at the bottom here. But if we wanted to change this to what he was mentioning, which was the, um, the 817.9, it changes things a bit. So I can make this now the 8. Here's the 17, and all it's gonna do is give us an earlier entry. Notice the whole thing shifted over a little bit and basically gets you in just a little bit earlier um, than it would with the 1226. So Naum and others are asking questions about that. Does that make sense? You guys get that? That's It's really simple. It's just a basic calculation. Remember, if you're using an 817 for your MACD, which you can see over here on the left-hand side of my screen, the shorter we make those, the, the sooner signal, the, the earlier we're gonna get a signal. Right, it, the earlier we'll get signals, but you're going to get a lot more signals. The longer time frame you go, so let's say instead of using an 8, 20, uh, 17, we did a 12, 26, we're going to get fewer signals and we may actually, we might be a little bit later to the party, but we have greater confirmation that it's actually trending in the direction that it's going. Okay? Um, 
I think, uh, Raj, I think it's actually down below where it says stickers. There's like a little dollar sign on the YouTube channel. I, I, I think right underneath the chat box, there's like a dollar sign. So there's like custom emojis, and then there's like a dollar sign right underneath where you type in chat. At least on my screen it is. Um, Brendan, Ichimoku, I actually looked at those for a little bit. I gave up. Um, honestly, I couldn't really tell you much about it. I'm not an Ichimoku guy. I know I, I actually have some friends that are Ichimoku. If I'm not mistaken... Um, Brandon Wendell uses Ichimoku, not like religiously, but he knows it. Of course, you know, Brandon Wendell is a CMT, Charter Market Technician, so he's going to um, have a, a better understanding of a lot of these indicators. But, you know, I, I could go and look at it and explain it in depth to you and just give me an hour or so because I've used almost all of these indicators in the past. Um, my main thing is this. If we're using indicators, whatever they are, you want to be using the ones that more people are using. So as, I, as I'll just show you here, I can open up in TradeStation and go insert analysis technique. And you guys see there's, there's hundreds of different indicators. And do I really want to go, oh my goodness, there is seriously something called the ulcer index. <laughs> the, there really is an ulcer index, guys. Do I care what the ulcer index is? No, because I don't want ulcers. Um, but there's all sorts of deviations and basically they'll take an indicator and they'll tweak it. What I like about what um, Jeffrey was talking about with his exit strategies and entrance strategies was that it just it just wanted to speed things up. So when he, I believe um, Joseph said he uses 1226 for sell signals because tops take longer to form. Okay, I, I, I for some reason I thought he was using the shorter term to get out, but maybe it was the shorter term to get in. Um, but the results were were pretty amazing, and it's not like he just kind of made up those numbers on using moving averages to get in or out on that six month period from November to April. It's just pure numbers. Uh, he basically said, let's, let's apply a MACD to it and see how that would have worked. And all of a sudden, you see the results uh, written pretty clearly in here that it's just uh, miles better than doing it by itself, just buying in November 1st and selling April. Um, yes, I like Fibonacci retracements, Brandon. I like Fibonacci retracements. Not a big fan of extensions or arcs or circles. I think the arcs, if anybody convinces you that Fibonacci arcs are the way to go, I'm sorry, I might make enemies here. You're dealing with an idiot. I'll show you why. Let me, at least this is just the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. So let me delete some of this stuff. Disable moving averages. I'll disable this one as well. And I'll show you why these are got to be one of the dumbest things ever done. So let's go. I'm trying to find. Let, let, let me go Microsoft. Bring up Microsoft. I think I have arcs on here. Yeah, I do have arcs on here. Great. All right. So let's say we're, we're looking at... Um, this run up from Microsoft, which went from this lows here in March, and we'll put the line across the highs. Okay, so now if we just kind of scroll out here, it's going to tell us, well, yeah, let, let me do this again from a different spot just because it didn't, doesn't work well when it's at all time highs. The arc, let's say it's, I want to do it from this big move up here in October, and I go to these highs right here. Well, what, how, no matter what, because time is moving forward and our chart is moving forward, there is no scenario possible in history where it won't hit these lines. Because prices, the candles are being built from left to right. So no matter what, it's going to hit these lines. I think anybody who uses ARCs is an idiot. Sorry, they're, they're really stupid. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so Koji uses them. Cool. I, I mean, look, Ichimoku I got no problem with because there's some nice calculations. I just don't use them and they're not really my my bread and butter. But like this is just a dumb indicator that somebody created the um, the arcs, Fibonacci arcs, guys. Anyway, let's see. Uh, the main indicators I use are 250. Yeah. So the only, so Brendan says the main indicators I use are the 50 and 200 day moving averages and Bollinger Bands. You know, the only challenge there is if you're using a 50 and 200, you're dealing with very historical lagging information. So if you're looking for any sort of signal from them, you're late to the party, but you're not. I'm pretty sure Brendan's using them as trend support and saying, okay, let's see, um, as long as it stays above this, I'll stay in those trades. <laughs> Arcs are worse than white space. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Um, all right, let me real quickly, uh, are those, oh, thank you, Go appreciate that very much. There was, you're making a good Tuesday for me, guys. Are those MACDs applicable only for ETFs? No, Raj, they, you can use them on anything. So let me bring up real quick, I'll bring up, um, let me take off these stupid arcs because I'm gonna be stuck on my Microsoft chart and I don't wanna embarrass myself in public with that on my chart. Um, if I go out here and I'll add in MACD again, okay, we'll just add in the MACD. And you'll, you'll always know my cynicism here because honestly, you should be able to look at the price chart and see what the MACD is doing, period. That it's just, that's, I'm, I'm way better just looking at the price chart. But here's a, here's a stock, you wanna look at ETF, here's SPY. 
right? So MACD is working. I'm not sure why it's uh, not scaling here. It should be auto scaling, but it send team seems to be not auto scaling on this one. I'm not sure why that is happening. Okay, well, um, let me see if I, oh, that's why. There we go. So you see down at the bottom, it's pretty much following what price is doing. So this is the MACD on an ETF. You want to see MACD on gold futures? Here's MACD on gold futures. Want to see it on Bitcoin? Here's MACD on Bitcoin. So it can be put on anything. Remember, all it does is go back and take historical promise. It's flowing today. Raj, thank you very much. Appreciate it. I was making my, making my day out there. I wish I had a glass of whiskey right now with all the love I'm getting. Um, so yeah, MACD can be used on anything. It is a, I, I would say this. It's a great support tool. Just don't lean on it to be making your trades. I actually really like how Jeff was saying, it's just, it's helping me time my entries and exits. He already knows he wants to buy or sell and he's using this to help get the right point for him, right? Let that thing confirm in turn. There you go. Yeah, and Brennan, confirm what I thought. I, I knew you were I knew you were smart, Brennan. They're using them as trend confirmation. That's all those should be used for, yep. Um, Harley says, what do I think about Snowflake? My opinion on Snowflake, for those that watch, no, I, I would not want to trade it. S-N-O-W. Here's Snowflake. Um, I personally would stay away from it just because you got a company that is bumped up because Warren Buffett bought into it, not because it's a great company. And they're competing against Amazon Web Services and Microsoft Azure. These are the two of the biggest names in the history of financial markets who dominate that scene and that space. For Snow to get any foothold in that industry, they're going to have to ask somebody to stop using Amazon Web Services. And to me, that just ain't going to happen. So I'm not a big fan of it. Um, let's see. What else do I got? Mm -mm, mm -mm. Divergence work to Bitcoin. Yeah. And, and again, there's a lot of other ways we can look at divergences, diver uh, positive divergences, negative divergences, and things like that. Okunola, thank you as well, my friend. Oh, I, I think I might get a bottle of Blanton's today with all your donations. Thank you guys so much. Uh, let me real quickly show you uh, a couple things here that I wanted to get into. I, I, for some of you asking, yes, I went out to Boston, had a great time uh, this weekend. Here is, I went to Salem, right? You get the Salem witch trials out there. So, of course, it's, uh, you know, very popular. And beautiful city. If you haven't been, you should go. Just do not go whatever you do in the month of October because obviously the Salem witch trials uh, were there and everybody wants spooky witch stuff and Hocus Pocus was filmed there. But check this out. This is how busy, I, I, I'm curious, has any of you been to an event that was this busy in the last six months? Since COVID started, I could not believe, it was shoulder to shoulder people on the streets with an hour and a half wait to get into restaurants and these stupid stores that were selling like little witches and little boo things. It was crazy, like an hour and a half wait to get it to sit down to have a beer somewhere. It was nuts, I could not believe it. But they did a good job. Um, pretty much 99.9% .9 of people all had their masks on. Um, but here's what I wanted to end with today before I get to the economic announcements for tomorrow. Uh, if you think you're having a bad day, if any of you guys are struggling and think you're having it rough, just remember that Giles Corey on September 19th of 1692 was pressed to death. So life is life is good. Uh, this is actually right near one of the cemeteries there. And I tell you, I think it was August 16th of 1692. There were so many people hanged or, or pressed to death or stoned. It was really kind of a, a creepy thing to go through um, Salem. But it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city. Okay, um, here is what happened today. By the way, guys, almost every one of these companies except BlackRock took a dump today, right? Buy the rumors, sell the news. These are earnings announcements. Johnson & Johnson beat earnings, right? They, they're surprised on earnings. When I read these percentages, guys, um, they beat by 10%. JP Morgan beat by 24%. Uh, Citigroup beat by 38. Of course, Delta Airlines only missed by five. But every one of these except BlackRock was down substantially today. Pretty big, big down day, uh, even though some of them did gap up on earnings. Here's what's cooking for tomorrow. So we had big banks reporting, and that to me sets the stage. You've got Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, Progressive, and U.S. Bancorp reporting tomorrow. Monster day for financials. Judging by the reaction that we saw happen today on J.P. Morgan and Citigroup, I'm not feeling so confident about these earnings announcements tomorrow. You also have United Healthcare Group, uh, Progressive, Alcoa, and United Airlines. So remember, Delta beat today. Uh, Delta just barely missed it. I'm sorry. United Airlines probably will as well. Um, what else do we have? This is the economic calendar for tomorrow. You can see that we have PPI number, which are producer price index. We talked to Jeffrey Hurst today about some of the inflation that uh, everybody says is not there. We both feel it is there. 
CPI numbers came out today right in line with expectation at 0.2% gain, so no real surprise there. That's what's expected tomorrow for producer price index is just a 0.2% gain in inflation or uh, the cost of that basket of goods and services. You also have several members of the FOMC speaking tomorrow. You got Kaplan, you got Quarles, um, yeah, and Clarita speaking. Other than that, the only real big news will be from Australia. They have unemployment rate, which is expected to rise, and some employment change numbers. Okay. Uh, I think that for me, that was it on the economic announcements and earnings announcements. Just keep an eye out for tomorrow because there will be a lot. Um, and Nick says, you know, Johnson & Johnson stopped their trial. You're going to, I think, again, this is the challenge. A lot of people want to capitalize on these COVID drug companies and maybe they're going to get rich off them. I'll tell you what, a lot of them could take big baths too because they've been pumped up on the hopes they're going to come out with some drug. All of a sudden, a lot of people missing, um, not getting approval or pulling back their drug from trials because they're seeing tons of bad side effects. I can assure you, I will not be the first one to get that vaccine. I will wait a long time before I wait to get that vaccine, if I ever get it at all. All right, what else? Um, <laughs> yeah, Brendan says, I just hope the markets just keep behaving as usual, aka derp, bye, 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 derp. <laughs> yeah, uh, it is rather funny, and it's funny, uh, we did... We had comment from one of the viewers the other day asking if um, if I thought that Trump saying no stimulus till after the election was a hoax or a joke, and I said, yeah, I think so. And again, I, you know, bottom line, the way it seems to be trading this market, and I hate to say it because it doesn't do anything with technicals or fundamentals, it's just simple psychology, is anytime Trump says something negative about the market or that causes it to drop, just buy it. Because two, three, four days later, he'll come back out and say the exact opposite. And all of a, it's like that three steps forward, two steps back thing, where you get that two step drop and it's ready to rip to the upside. And man, this market over the past week has been absolutely incredible. Um, as we rip through those highs that we had about, I think, what, three weeks ago? We were talked about on the show where I said if we get above some of these highs here, you know, you have a long way to go to rip, and that, that's when you were sitting right here, right around 3,400, right? And I said after we get above this, if you could have closed above that, you, there's nothing really to stop this till we get to that all-time high, maybe the 3,500. Well, we ripped through that yesterday or yeah, yesterday's session like nothing. It was really, really, really quick. So uh, we'll see what happens on tomorrow's trading session. It seems very optimistic the way things are flowing. Uh, all the indicators right now saying things look great except for Bollinger Bands, um, RSI, and Stochastics. All going to tell you that this thing is way overbought. For those that don't believe me, I'll just throw on one of those just so we can. Uh, let's go to Stochastics. All right, so you've got uh, Stochastics is up at 94. Remember, anything above 80 is technically deemed to be overbought. Well, yeah, it's overbought on that. It's going to be overbought on RSI and all these other ones. So uh, you do have some uh, contrarian red flags, if you will, that are pointing towards a market correction here. But, hey, if they uh, if they come out with some big stimulus thing, you'll rip through all-time highs like nothing. It's crazy. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Welcome back. Uh, sorry if I had that two-day break. I'm also going to be taking off another couple of days here in a couple of weeks as I get out of town yet again. i got to do more traveling. Right? Enjoy life. Stop and smell the roses along the way. Um, for tomorrow, uh, let me real quickly check here. We've had all kinds of scheduling adjustments and changes going on to who's going to be on the program, so I want to make sure I get the exact right guests because I do have three guests lined up for today. We've had a couple minor changes along the way, but I think all in all we'll do fairly well. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to have uh, Brandon Wendell, and the topic is going to be surviving high volatility. Okay, so maybe you guys want, you can throw into the chat there about Ichimoku. Maybe Brandon will do a little lesson on Ichimoku Clouds, but uh, whatever you guys want. It's your show. i just the one here talking the whole time. So, uh, guys, if you have any questions, comments, feel free to put those down below the YouTube videos. If you like today's show, do me a favor, give me a thumbs up, especially if you like Jeffrey Hirsch. Um, I would love to get him back on the program, but only if you guys want him back on. You can let me know who you like and who you dislike, and I'll do my best to get them on. You can also email me anytime on uh, TraderMerlin.com. There's a little button there that you can email if you have like graphics. Sometimes people want to send in charts. I uh, usually can't do that on the YouTube video, so you can send them in there at TraderMerlin.com. That'll do it for me, everybody. I will see you tomorrow with Brendan Wendell. Take care, everyone.